All right, well, uh, we continue our series called His Love, His Light, His Life, a series in 1 John. And we're in the second chapter now, about halfway through. We're in verse 18 of chapter 2. And he says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Is it the last hour, literally? Well, it's not the last hour, but certainly John is identifying that, hey, we are in the last days. Now, you might have noticed this is 2,000 years ago. What this tells you is that even the apostles did not have the market cornered on everything God. There were certain things that only God knew. And to this day, there are certain things that only God knows. So if someone is trying to turn the Bible into an algebra problem, if somebody is trying to turn the Bible into a fortune cookie and do all the math and then tell you when Jesus is coming back, you halt them in your tracks and point them to this passage. None of the apostles knew when Jesus would return. They were saying, Lord, come quickly, Maranatha. They were making their guesses, I'm sure. But of course, Jesus tells us that nobody knows the day, nobody knows the hour, nobody knows the time period. So why be one of those people that ends up with egg on our face when we've tried to make predictions that don't come true? And then what happens? We start tweaking them, right? We tweak our predictions and change them a little bit and change the math and recalibrate the formula. And out we crank with a new well, a new prediction, only to have egg on our face all over again. God knows certain things that we cannot know, that we don't know, and we just need to trust Him. Now, what about this word antichrist? I mean, since you were this high, maybe you heard about the antichrist in church. The antichrist is somebody who's going to pretend to be Jesus, and all of the church is going to be duped because this person is going to pretend to be Messiah. Well, there is a man of lawlessness. There is a religious figure that the Bible speaks about. And many will be tricked by that man of lawlessness. But the Antichrist is not someone who is pretending to be Jesus. The Antichrist is anyone and everyone who denies Jesus is Messiah. That is anti-Christ, anti-Jesus. And so the Apostle John here is saying that there are many out there that are teaching all kinds of falsehoods, including that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, including that Jesus is not the Messiah. And you need to know that all that garbage is anti-Christ. It goes against Jesus. So when we think of the term anti-Christ, we need to be careful. Maybe in our American Christian culture that we grew up in, there were certain books that gained popularity and used this term Antichrist as an imposter Messiah, as an imposter Jesus. But in reality, when we come back to God's word and we look at what Antichrist really means, it means someone who denies Jesus, denied his physicality perhaps, but definitely denied his deity. And so that's why he says, how many antichrists are hanging out right now? Many antichrists have appeared. There's somebody that's anti-Jesus. There's somebody anti-Jesus. And over there as well, there's a deceiver, a teacher who is, uh, who is pulling people away from the truth of the gospel. All of these are anti-Jesus. All of these are antichrists. So with that then, he says, they went out from us. Who? These false teachers. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are, all, they are not all of us. So this is what he's saying. 
There were a group of deceivers that were with us. They hung out with our congregation. They smiled. They hugged us. They shook our hands. They acted like one of us. They invited us to their teaching. They said, it's great that you're a Christian, but let me show you the nosos. Let me show you the higher knowledge. Let me introduce you to Jesus plus. And of course, you see out on our sign, we've got Jesus plus nothing. And they were doing the opposite. They were adding to Jesus. It was Jesus plus secret knowledge. Jesus plus Gnosticism. Jesus plus a higher plane that you can live on. And so they went out from among us. And what John is saying is, all that shows you, all that shows you is that they were never really connected with us spiritually. They geographically left us because they were never connected with us spiritually. Now, I know what the temptation is. I mean, people today, 2,000 years later, we're trying to explain how our buddy in high school, yeah, I had this buddy in high school and he seemed like he was a believer and he said all this stuff about Jesus and then later he denied Christ or said he was an atheist. Or, so, but what about him? But what about Philip or what about Jason or what about Lisa? And we've got our stories about people who have left the church. This verse is not intended to explain every scenario out there. Look, we've got a couple of choices at least when we have a friend who has experienced what I described. I mean, the first choice, of course, is that they were hanging out with church, but they were never in the church. They were hanging out with people who know Jesus, but they never knew Jesus. All they knew was clean up your act, live a better life, uh, ditch bad looking stuff, do good looking stuff, and join the country club called church and hang out with good folk, right? My dad would have been one of those. My dad gave a testimony on a Sunday morning in his church, and he was not yet a Christian. Many of you have heard this story, but he gave up. A wonderful testimony about Christian community and Christian values and Christian principles. And everybody applauded at the end. Guy Farley, what a great guy. The only problem is he didn't know Jesus yet. It wasn't for several more years that he would know the Lord Jesus Christ and that Christ would come to live inside of him. So there are many who play church and look at it as a conservative club And maybe even think Jesus is a great teacher of many nice principles. And I can apply those to my family and my community and my personal life. We can believe those things without being inhabited by the Spirit of Christ. And perhaps that's one explanation. The other explanation for your buddy who went AWOL is this. They were a genuine believer and they still are. If they were, they are. If they are, they were. So they were and are a true believer, but you know what they got sick of? They got tired of you. Yeah. I know. I know that's hard to believe, but they left the church because you was in it. They got tired of church because you were annoying. You just graded on them. I'm not saying you personally, but the church community just graded on. They love Jesus, but they hate church. Because the church they've experienced, the church atmosphere, she amens that, that's good. (laughs) The church atmosphere they have experienced was nothing but judgmental and critical and difficult and stressful and backbiting. And it ended not with something peaceful, but something stressful. And so they just said, I'm out of here. And it wasn't Jesus. It was just the church. And there is a difference. So, you know, we can't explain everybody's situation and we don't want to build a theology on Lisa or Philip or some other person. We don't want to build our theology on someone else's experience. We just know that if we're in Christ, we're in Christ. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No matter what, even if church people annoy you. (laughs) Verse 20. But you, you're not like those deceivers. You're not like those false teachers. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. What does this tell you? You have an innate, as a a believer, you have an innate, inborn 
understanding of the truth. I mean, how many times have you read a verse or how many times have you heard a message? How many times have you read a thought in a book, heard a message, turned on Christian radio, whatever it might be, and that thought hits you and you go, you know what? I always knew that. I mean, I can't explain it, but I always knew that in my heart. I never put words to it, but I always knew that was the truth. And then other times, you turn on that radio, you read that book, you hear that sermon or that message, and you go, you know what? Something, something's not right there. I, I got to check this out. I mean, I got to look deeper. I got to go ask questions. I got to probe. I got to poke. I got to look into God's Word because something doesn't sit right with me here. Something didn't sound right about that. How many times have you found that in your situation, in your life, and it's because you have an anointing? I know how we've used anointing. I mean, you know, in many ways, church communities, we've ruined the word anointing. Oh, it's great that you're a Christian, but now you need an anointing. Come forward for the anointing. We can't say it normal. We've got to say it funny like, come forward for the anointing. Can you say that with me? Anointing. Yes, you can make fun of it because... You've already got the anointing. The anointing is the Spirit, and the Spirit is the anointing. You have everything you need for life and godliness. This is written to the whole church, the entire congregation that is reading this letter. If they are in Christ, they have an anointing. It is not a second blessing. It is not a second hope. It is not something we beg for or plead for. It is Jesus. It's not even an it. He calls it an anointing, but the anointing is the Holy One. The anointing is Jesus Christ living in you. You are fully anointed. You don't need any more anointing. There's no extra oil that you need. You don't need a little more Wesson on top of what you've got. You have all of Jesus Christ that you will ever need. And that is why you know the truth instinctively. And when something is not of the truth, there is a radar within you. There is a lie detector within you. And something goes off. And you say, I need to look deeper. I'm not so sure about that. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. This is not a fake Jesus. This is not an imposter Messiah. This is not someone pretending to be the Christ. This is someone who is denying the Christ. And that is what it means to be anti-Christ. Make sense? So plain, isn't it? Do you see how we humans, we just like to mess stuff up, right? We cover over the truth and we got to peel back those layers and get back to what the Bible is actually saying. Now, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So are there many roads to God? I mean, maybe Allah is God, and then maybe, you know, Muhammad will bring us to God, and then maybe it's okay. You know, the, the, the Mormon God and the Jesus of the Mormonism, and then there's another Jesus over here, and then there's Buddha. Buddha will bring us. You know what? The Bible says there's one name under heaven by which we can be saved. Now, that's not my favorite doctrine. It's not my pet doctrine. It's not my belief that I invented. It's the Word of God. It's the truth. So we go with the truth, right? I mean, if someone, if someone has an answer to your problem, go to the person who has an answer to your problem. Uh, if, if you need a surgery and the surgery is the only way to survive, why would you stay home? Go get the surgery. What if there's only one doctor who can perform that kind of surgery? There's only one trustworthy surgeon who can perform that on you. Are you going to go to another doctor? Are you going to sit home and choose no doctor? No, I would go to the doctor who knows how to do the surgery. It's the same with Jesus Christ. There is one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And if we deny the Son, then we don't have the Father. So clear. People try to ridicule this. They call it exclusionism. Well, they don't have to call it exclusionism. Jesus called it that. He said, narrow is the gate. He is the only way. So exclusionism is not a criticism. It is a correct description of the gospel. The gate is narrow. It is not wide. There is one name, not many names. And so it's Jesus or nothing at all.
We don't make... We don't make the plan, do we? We don't make the way. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. As for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. You know, as I've said in the past, many people make much of this word abide. This word abide has become a mystical word. It's become a a fanciful word, a spiritual word where we just imagine someone is nearly levitating through life as they just abide in Christ. Every day they wake up and they just try to abide. And what they're saying is they're trusting. And so abide has become a synonym for trust. But it really shouldn't be that way because when you make abiding into a work or when you make abiding into something progressive that you need to aspire to every day, then 1 John is not going to make a lot of sense. So we have to really understand what abide means. Right now, most of us in this room, we abide in West Texas, don't we? We abide in the state of Texas. That is where we live. We don't have to try to live there. We're just here. This is our location. This is our geography. This is where we live. Abide is a fancy word for live. And so what he's saying is, if what you heard from the beginning lives in you. Do you remember he just got done saying the truth is in us and we instinctively know we have this anointing that is in us. So if the truth, if what you've heard from the beginning now lives in you, then you also will live in the Son and in the Father. Now, that is a fact. That is not a hope. As a believer, you don't hope for this. As a believer, you don't hope this is going to work out. I sure hope I learn to abide. I sure hope I figure out how to abide like those mature Christians. No, this is true of every believer. Every believer lives in Jesus. Every believer has Jesus living in them. So abide is just a fancy word for live. Now... He says, this is the promise which, we, which he himself made to us, eternal life. I love this because it's such a simple thing. And this verse, which is just several words long, this promise is two words long, eternal life. There's all, that's all there is to it. And probably the most popular question we get as a church and through the ministry and on the radio broadcast, and maybe you've gotten over the years, one of the most popular questions we get is, can I lose my salvation? Is God going to ditch me? Is God going to bail on me? Is God going to get sick of me? Can I out the grace of God? Can I exhaust the blood of Jesus? Is the blood going to run out on me? Is there going to be no blood left? Is there going to be no sacrifice left for my sins? Am, am I going to be caught, embarrassed at the final judgment and get a lesser heaven, a lesser experience, or total loss of salvation? And you know, what all of this hinges on is the truthfulness of God. You see, we're trying to make it hinge on our faithfulness. It doesn't hinge on our faithfulness. It hinges on the truthfulness of God. Is God a liar? That's what it comes down to. Because God has already spoken. See, we can speak all day long. We can talk about our issues. We can talk about our sins. We can talk about how big they are. We can talk about how frequent they are. We can talk about our struggles of all kinds. We can talk about that for years on end. But God has already spoken. And here's what he said. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. And I am able to save you completely because I always live to intercede for you. And you know what? That is for any sin imaginable. So here we are speaking about our sins, speaking about our sins, and we need to be speaking about our Savior. It is God and His truthfulness that that causes all of this to be stable and secure. He is our anchor. The fact that He is not a liar, that's what matters. This is His promise. So when the God of the universe makes a promise, well, it's a good promise. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Now, you might think this is just a random verse there. We'll just gloss over it. But I hope that you'll pay attention to what John is saying here because it's going to matter. In a minute, you're going to hear about a group uh, that doesn't sin. 
And then you're going to hear about a group that is of the devil. And then you're going to say, wait a minute, but I'm a Christian, but I still sin. And then you're going to say, but, but I'm not of the devil. So which group am I? Am I the group that doesn't sin or am I the group that's of the devil? And what we need to see is that as we continue reading here, John is talking about a group who's had this trend reversed within them. God is at work in them now. He who began a good work is going to carry it on to completion. They don't keep on keeping on in sin because they have found a new way to live. These other people are of the devil and they've got nothing but hate. These people have love infused in their hearts and God is renewing their minds. These people don't know anything about love. All they know is hate, especially for the church. So you notice verse 26. What I'm saying is watch what John is doing. I am writing you these things so that you can know the difference between this group and this group. I'm writing you so that you can know the difference between those who are deceiving you and then true believers. So that's what he's doing here. And I think that'll certainly help as we, as we finish up today. As for you, that anointing which you received from him abides in you. See that word abide? It just means live. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. So why is he saying, ah, you don't need anybody to teach you? Because there are people trying to teach bad stuff. There are deceivers. There are tricksters. There are people trying to dupe other people. And what he's saying is you need to trust the anointing that lives within you. You need to trust Christ in you. He is going to signal to you when this stuff does not match up with what you heard. And so you can trust him. You don't need to be depending on these tricksters who don't know what they're talking about. Now, do we still have each other today? I mean, the Bible says that we belong to one another. We encourage one another. That's what the body of Christ is. So he's not doing away with the body of Christ. But trust me, if you were on a, a desert island all alone and you were a believer and you had Christ living in you, you would still grow and you would still learn. Where's your Bible? Well, it was in your luggage when you fell out of the plane. It was in your luggage. So you don't have it with you. So is that going to be okay? Is that going to work out? Yeah, it's going to work out. You know, 80% of the early church was illiterate. They couldn't read anyway. They might have had one epistle, maybe two at most, and 80% of them couldn't read it, so they had to have it read aloud. Now, after you've had that read aloud three and four and five and 25 times, you kind of got it memorized, but that's all you've got. And so there's something deeper than that. As great as it is to have the Word of God cover to cover, published and available to us today, anytime at our fingertips, that is awesome. And, and we're looking to the Word of God this morning. But the Word abides in you. Jesus is the living Word, and He abides in you. And that is unshakable and unbreakable. His anointing teaches us about all things. Now, little children... Live in Him, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. Do you see now why it's so important to understand what abide means? This doesn't mean do your best. Do your best to trust Him enough, and then maybe, just maybe, you won't experience shame. No, we already know the truth of the gospel. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves punishment. The one who fears is not perfected in God's love. So there is no punishment left for the believer. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what is he saying here? If you don't live in him yet, make sure you live in him. Get in Him. If you're still in Adam, watch out. Get in Christ. That's where you need to be. And if you are living in Him, then there is no cause for fear. People are freaking out about the final judgment. People are worried about what God is going to say about them. Every idle word and everything you've ever done, it's going to be brought up on that movie screen. We got all kinds of crazy theologies that we just sort of grew up with. Why? Where did they come from? 
You know, I travel and I speak and I say, when I say, you guys ever pictured that movie screen in the sky, the one with all your sins? And everybody's like, yeah, amen. And they raise, where, where did that come from? See, that came from our, hum, our humanity. It came from our brain. It came from our background. It came from our culture because, well, we're really good at religion and we're really good at fear and we're really good at punishment and we're really good at rules and breaking rules and giving eternal consequences to people for breaking rules. And that's what every human religion that has been invented, nearly all of them look like that. So we're really good at that sort of thing. But the gospel takes that and turns it upside down, turns it on its ear, dashes it to pieces, and shows us that there's no fear in love. So we don't need to shrink away. In fact, Hebrews says we can eagerly await him. It's the opposite of shrinking away. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. So again, what's he trying to do? Contrast. There are people who are born of him and we've got a new practice. Do you always do righteous stuff? No, but you've got a new practice. Right? It's just like someone who practices law. Are they always practicing law? No. Sometimes they're doing other stuff. But they go into the office and they practice law. A doctor, is he always practicing medicine? No. He's a doctor now. That's his label. That's his title. That's his profession. That's who he is in his role. But he doesn't always practice medicine, does he? You're a child of God. That's your label, but it's deeper than a label. That's your identity. You are a practicer of righteousness. Do you always do righteous stuff? No. But your nature has been changed, and so has your practice. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And I love this verse because he sort of stops. And such we are, like it's just dawned on him, right? And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, we're going to cover some of this next week, but let me just read as this part uh, continues and concludes here. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Are you a child of God? Yes. When are you a child of God? Now we are children of God. Is it exciting to think about what we will be with resurrected bodies? Absolutely. But don't you miss the now Don't miss the present because you're focused on the future. That right now, right here in the present, we are children of God. We're born of Him. That changes your DNA. That changes your DNA spiritually. That that is the heart surgery. We said you need a surgery, go to the right doctor. Well, we went. We went to the Father. And what He did was He took out our heart of stone. And He gave us a new living heart like His. It changes our heart. It changes our DNA. It changes our passions and desires. It changes what we want. So we will be like Him. But right now, we are like Him. Do you know that? It says that we are like Him. John writes that in another place. He says, as He is, so also are we in this world. That's right now. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Your thoughts, your attitudes, your behaviors. Gosh, I'm born of God. I'm just like Jesus at the core. Are you kidding me? I've got the heart surgery. I've got the DNA swap. Why wouldn't this affect my attitudes and actions? I'm going to let it. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness that is chaos crazy stuff all over the place no guide no comforter no counselor no truth teller you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin no one who abides in him this is where I wanted to get to I wanted you to see this because this is the challenge no one who abides in him sins No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, two thoughts about this as we finish out. The word abides here, it means lives, right? 
So if you live in Him, then guess what? You've seen Him and you know Him. You've seen Him spiritually and you know Him. You're one with Him. If you don't live in Him, then you haven't seen Him and you don't know Him. Okay, so this confirms what we've said about the word abide, right? You're either in Him, living in Him, knowing Him, seeing who He is, or you're still in Adam and you don't see Him and you don't know Him. Now, what about this part where no one uh, who abides in Him sins? Well, that's talking about the practice, the keep on keeping on. The verb tense here is the keep on keeping on, and that's why some translations translate it as practice, or keep on sinning. So, do we still commit sins? James says so. James says we all stumble in many ways, right? But has there been a change in your life? Have you noticed going from unbeliever to believer that there is something new going on? There's a new practice. There's a new trend. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices, get this, do you have the new practice? Watch this. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus is righteous. Now, slow down in your mind. This is the la- I believe this is the last verse we're going to see. Look at verse 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. So now, there's only two kinds of people. Here they are, verse 7 and verse 8. Now, who are you? Are you of the devil? See, if you're not of the devil, then that puts you in the category of, I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous. Where's the third person? Where's the third group? Where's the third category? It doesn't exist. Yeah, but what about the people who are becoming righteous? No such thing. What about the people who are becoming perfect in God's sight? No such thing. What about the people who are becoming like Jesus in their status before God? No such thing. You're either of the devil or you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Now there's a choice to make walking out of this building today. Who are you at the core? Oh, we still make mistakes. We still commit sins. But we are completely forgiven, past, present, and future. And on top of that, it is not just forgiveness. You are born of God. You are born of the Spirit. You are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Now tell that to your friend when you walk out of here, and you're going to get some stares. I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ. See ya. That does not fly. The best you're going to get is, well, yeah in Christ, as if that's not real, you see. The best you're going to get is in God's eyes, as if God is faking it. Are you born again or are you born again? Are you born of Him or are you born of Him? Are you born of the Spirit? Do you really have a new heart or is that just in God's eyes? This change is real. This change is now. And you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. But I still sin. I didn't say you became righteous by what you do. I said you became righteous by birth, new birth in Him, and that's real. What did we see today? Anyone who denies Jesus is anti-Christ. That's the real anti-Christ. Those who deny the Son don't have the Father. Many roads to God, many beliefs. Can you be anti-Jesus and get to the Father? No way. There's one name under heaven. We have an anointing. That's not for later, a second blessing, a second experience. We all have the anointing, the Holy Spirit living in us. We know the truth instinctively. At our core, our heart cries out. We are promised eternal life, and that is real. Lastly, you abide in Him. He lives in you. and You are righteous as he is righteous. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this righteousness. We don't understand it. We don't always live it. We don't always show it. We don't always think it. We don't always feel it. But we believe you. We believe that we are deeper than our thoughts. We believe that we are deeper than our feelings. We believe that we are deeper than an emotional experience. We believe 
that we are spirit and soul and body and that you dwell within our spirits and we worship you today. We worship you in spirit and in truth. And you tell us the truth is we are born of you. The truth is we are a new creation. The truth is that we have a new practice, a new trend, because you abide in us and we abide in you. Father, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for how rich they are, how deep they are, how meaningful they are. And we just ask, Father, that your spirit that by your Spirit, you would remind us of these truths in the times we need it most. In Jesus' name, amen.